Oh well, if it was flowing weather, you'd be plowing. If it was frosty weather, you'd be putting out dung. And then, after the dung was out, if it was weather at all, you'd be plowing. Getting ready for the, the seed going in the spring of the year. Well, there were neeps to drive in, and breeds to bed, and dunk to drive out. But it was between the flowing light and that, and then you'd be sowing, harring and rolling, and then you'd put in your tatties, drilling for tatties, drilling for turnips, sawing turnips, and then you'd be waiting on them coming to the singling. The daughter would be singled in the days, do you see? And then the high was on, that would have to be cut and cold, or we done with porks and they'd be all on your labour. There's no bailm and things like what they have now. It sat in rocks for maybe maybe three weeks or a month and then it had to be driven in and start, but into big stacks. And then that they'd be broke find out the stacks maybe twelve wood every week into the cattle for feeding. And then the harvest come on, you had to bind their cutting, stook in, stack in, thatch in, and then you was back into the winter again. I mean, digging potatoes by hand. They backed up, I've seen them backing up drills of potatoes with a, a small three-toed, flat-toed grape. And they pushed the spade, uh, this grape, in behind the, each potato and shoved out with their knee two drills at a time. And they, they dug, backed up a drill, digging two drills. And the women come on behind, lifting potatoes, putting them into barrels, and you all the potatoes that for some reason or other went into barrels in those days, which held maybe ten stone of potatoes, and they slung them into the cart, and, and they carted them away, and they were maybe uh, graded at the time of the store. Sometimes they left the seed out and let it green, and they kept the, the seed down away separate. But you used to lift a lot of potatoes for us, Haggard men you used to lift a lot of tatties at Finkley when I was a boy, and most of them were lifted green in the month of August, September. You, you recognised your, the size of your farm by the size of your horse mill. Well, the weir farms had a two horse mill, and there was a, a four horse mill, and a six horse mill. There was no, no, I didn't know any bigger than six. Stove Hall was a six. This was a four. A uh, little Gala Hill had a two horse, and they were varied in between that. You had your round shed, and there was a shaft. The, the, the overhead beams went over each horse, and there's two supports, one in each side, which were fixed on front and back. It went down onto a middle shaft, and there was a single iron rod, and it went through the other side, and then there was a gear on the end of it, and the belt drove onto the mill, and that's how it, it worked. They, they had to have an open space to go in. They were driven from above. The horse walked in below, and then it was fixed back from the collar back onto the onto the yoke. And they had a friction chain that just went round the back. The the old it wasn't a high speed drum; it was an old pipe drum. And the the difference between that and the high speed drum was with the pipe drum were two very very heavy rollers that were driven at a slower speed than the drum, and you push the sheaves. Spread the sheaf out, and it went through their, their slow rollers, and it got buffered with the pipes coming round. Uh, that was the means of thrashing at that, in, that, in those days. It was quite airy. It would be quite airy. It was just the wind, the grinding round. It would just be, it was no grind, because it was oak teeth on the, on the gearing. It was all wood. It was no metal at all. There would just be the, the creak of the harness. Uh, and, and the squeak of the wood, working wood against wood. But that would be the, all the noise it would be. The woodworking inside is something to, just unbelievable. Then they could say, well, the, the various boards, how they dug, tugged and uh, set them in. Oh, it's, uh, it really is fantastic. They would get their mid in every forenoon and afternoon, which was a piece and tea or if it was very hot, they would have a, a flagon of mealy water, oatmeal and water. And uh, at the thrashing time, it would be uh, a grey beard of whiskey, which would be quite cheap in these days. Yeah. A grey beard, yes, 
it was a, a earthenware flask and the, uh, this was what everybody had. You yourself helped out the, the, the travelling mill? I am. I went up in the top and loud did I spoke about, which was two women up in the top with knives cutting the string and handing them to a man to feed into the, into the mill. Cutting roads, or opening roads, was uh, the term that was used for cutting round outside our field to make a road so that the horse could go round with the first turn of the binder and no damage any any of the standing grain. It was always done before a field was before they were going to start the binder, and the, the of course it was done with scythe usually. I can I can remember it always being done with scythe. They went the counter way from the way the binder was going to go, so that they were laying the, the cut grain to the outside. Of course, there was always usually two women with a scythesman coming behind the scythesman. One gathered the stuff into a quantity to be a sheaf, and the other one, she was making the barns some stalks of the grain, she twisted them like that and then laid them on the ground and the, the woman who had the, made the sheaf laid her sheaf on this, took two ends of the, the, the two ends of the, of the band, drew it up like that tight, twisted it round maybe twice and tucked the end in so that it stayed tied. She didn't tie a knot but she just twisted it twice and stuck it under, under, underneath the band and that held it and then these were lying eh, ready for stooking and of course when you were if it was held ground you were working on you stooked your stooks if it was at all possible not along the along the, the bray but up and down the bray the right way to set stooks was to you'd always to set them facing with one end facing to the prevailing winds. When we were at Valverde, where Far and I farmed latterly, we, I was always told, set your stooks facing Loch Leven. That was sort of southwest, northeast. Mm. And they got the prevailing winds that way through them. And Valverde was a very hilly farm. It was a, a fairly, if it was a decent season at all, it was a fairly easy harvested place because it's sitting high like that it got a lot of the wind and it, it, it uh, stuff dried out well with it. You know, people judged a farmer by stackyard and the, the stacks, you know, there, there was one local farmer not very far from here and they made beautiful stacks. Everybody took a pride in their stacks and uh, men were engaged by their references, always, almost always uh, refer to their ability to build stacks, to keep up the hearts. You must keep up the heart to a, a stack. And people that made a, didn't they keep up the heart to a stack were no use to a firm tune. That's what they were told, you know, you must, you must, because you know what I mean by keeping up the heart to a stack. They, it wouldn't run in the rain. A stack was built so that it was waterproof, really. So that always to keep plant your heart in a stack. Now, you say, well, why didn't some of them not do it? And of course the reason is, it was an awful easier to build a good stack, just to let them build it flat. Uh, the sheave is all flat, then they didn't slip so easy. But you can understand, if you have a, a nine foot, as we had in those days, always a nine foot boss in the centre of a stack. It was a tripod, nine feet tall, and sparred round. And that was to the air up the centre of the stack. Now, when you start to build, you, you built them against the, this tripod. And you kept the heads sloping up a bit. And so you put in a ring of hearting, and then depending on the width of the stack, so many rings of after that to, to get the stack in plumb straight up the sides. It was easy, comparatively easy, to build a stack with the sheaves flat. But whenever you start to slope them up, they tend to slip with you. And they slip out and make a bad stack, and the, the stack was uneven, and it would, it would, I've seen stacks stop over altogether. But wheat stacks were built very much bigger no, than, than corn stacks, and you need it, usually the coal on a wheat stack. 
that meant somebody the man the cat fucked up the sheaves to the coal who in turn fucked them without touching the, the stack at all you took them from one fuck to the other not changing the fucks I mean but you you took them off the man the cat's fuck and put it in position for the builder mm-hmm. that's what we call them a local name or just you know but we did the same for the haystacks as well and that was much more difficult a sheaf is tied with a string but a a fork of, of loose hay is very much more difficult to take from one fork to another and pass on to a third without breaking up the, the, the fork fork. That was quite a skill. And, and I could tell you quite a lot about hay, the difference in hay making mm-hmm. now from then. You know, it was a different job, a hard working job altogether. But that, making, making hay in those days. Between Stone Hill and Lawrence County, tell him I did fee. Twas to a wealthy farmer, his foreman for to be. To drive he told his horses, either in cut or plough, for it's anything I took in hand I very well could do.